Hello everyone, this is Scarzig, and welcome back to another episode of The Markup, a Legends of Runeterra series where I help you improve as a player by deeply analyzing some of my own gameplay using some visual aids. It looks like you're ready to begin, so let's get started. Unfortunately, with this particular game, I did uh, miss the intro. It's important to note that my opponent is uh, running Mono Shadow Isles against our Mono Demacia deck, and they do have Elise in here. I hovered that a little bit later in the recording, um, but just as a heads up for uh, when you're figuring out your mulligan. As usual, please pause the video here, see what you feel like you'd want to mulligan out of this starting hand, and uh, I'll go more into the decisions I make uh, right off of the bat here. So we have a 2-drop, a 3-drop, and two 5-drops. I think it's pretty obvious that you don't want to keep uh, both 5-drops, or maybe even none of them. Um, is definitely the first point to consider. Swiftling, Swiftwing Lancer goes back. I think out of these two, Garen is the one that you keep in this matchup. Okay, so the thing about Mono Shadow Isles is you have to think, why is my opponent running Mono Shadow Isles? And based on the current metagame at the time of, you know, this video, um, it's because Wraith Caller is very, very strong. So this is most likely going to be a swarmy Wraith Caller list. Um, so there's going to be a lot of early aggression, um, a very wide board, fearsome units especially, um, which is what you have to consider. And I'm thinking to myself, do I want to keep the Garen? Because I know that if I play it on turn 5, he's pretty much guaranteed to stick and he's going to provide me a lot of defensive value, right? Um, and at the same time, it's do I want to mulligan Garen and try to get more early pressure? Um, looking at the list for this Mono Demacia, um, I really don't have a lot of units that can contest Fearsome early, so it doesn't really matter what I play because it's almost like I'm not playing anything at all. The best I'd be able to do if I were to get some early game units, uh, notably Fleet Feather Tracker, um, is pretty much just to pressure my opponent on, uh, on my offensive turn and maybe force them to block. Most Fearsome players do not take that bait. They let you just over open attack them because they know that their fearsome units are just going to hit you right back. Um, so I decide that um, we get to keep Garen, right? Because again, the five mana, five five with regenerate can block the fearsome units and just that repeated value they a blocker they can't get through realistically with this deck is just going to be absolutely huge. And uh, so we don't need the Swift Wing Lancer. Um, and I do decide, um, after a little bit of consideration, to keep the Vanguard Redeemer. Um, simply because if things get a little bit too dicey in the early game, I do have a 3 attack unit that can block Fearsome. Um, it's very unlikely that its draw is going to go off, because if I can't defend with my units, then it's harder for my units to, uh, to be killed. Vanguard Redeemer, again, draws you a card if a friendly uh, ally... If a friendly ally, if a friendly unit has died uh, that round. So my opponent just opens with Hapless Aristocrat. Um, no big deal, we're just going to pass. We do get the chance to open up with the uh, Vanguard Defender here. Now, Vanguard Defender has Tough, which means that it takes one less damage from every instance of damage. So suffice to say, uh, things that deal one damage, like Vile Feast and things like that deal zero damage, uh, and it can block spiderlings and whatnot, or the, the hapless aristocrat, for example, for free, because the, the one attack isn't going to phase it at all. So it's a pretty decent opener here for this deck. Um, so my opponent just um, attacks with Elise, and uh, this is pretty important here, this block. Now, Elise in her base form is fearsome, which means that we can't block here. Um, furthermore, we can uh, we have the choice of blocking the hapless aristocrat or this spider, right, with the vanguard defender. And I opt to just take out this spiderling. When when Elise attacks, she summons a spiderling. And uh, the the issue here is that if I block the hapless aristocrat, my opponent will get a one one spider, and then this one will stay alive, right? So that means they have Elise and two spiders. And Elise's level up condition is having three spiders in play. So, if I block the Hapless Aristocrat, I'm giving my opponent two spiders, and so obviously we're just going to block 
uh, this spiderling over here to cut off the value from my opponent. The only argument I could say for maybe blocking the uh, hapless, arist hapless aristocrat there would be uh, maybe if you wanted to give them a slightly worse glimpse beyond. Um, but now it's on our turn, and I'm just going to play the Laurent Protégé. I'm going to have trouble blocking the Fearsome Units, but with Challenger, Laurent Protégé allows me to maybe deal one damage to this Aristocrat, maybe put some pressure on the Elise. My opponent counters back with Frenzied Skitterer. A, uh, another Fearsome Unit, it's a 3-3, three, three, that debuffs my board. So now I have a 1-2 and a 1-4. Nothing really I can do uh, this turn. I just have to take the L and pass. That's that's one of the things you do need to consider when you're trying to set up your offensive turns against Shadow Isles, especially Swarmy Spider decks like this, is the Frenzied Skitterer can shut down the, the favorable trades that you were hoping to take for yourself. And so here comes the uh, Wraith Caller here on 4 mana. Uh, Wraith Caller again, 4 mana, 4-3, four, summons a Mist Wraith, uh, which is at a base 2-2. Two, two. Um, this is a very, very powerful card. They very recently um, did nerf this card. Uh, the Wraith Caller itself used to have Fearsome 2, um, so that you couldn't block either of these with, uh, very weak units. Like, and you can see this turn that's coming up, um, the Vanguard Defender only has 2 attack, Laurent Protégé only has 2 attack, so, uh, I, I can't block, the only thing I can block on the board right now is the Aristocrat and the Wraith Caller. And you can see here with the stat line, I don't even have good trades against it, so this is pretty rough. Uh, so we're gonna take we're gonna take a lot of damage here, um, and you can see here just kind of me mulling over the decision. I have the opportunity to play one more unit before my opponent attacks. I do have the opportunity here. Uh, you see, I'm thinking about it. I do still have the Vanguard Redeemer in my hand, uh, which if a unit dies, I can play it, and then I'll be able to draw a card. So what I could do is wait till after combat, block the van block the Mist Wraith with Vanguard Redeemer or something so it dies, and then I get to draw off of the uh, Vanguard Redeemer. Um, the only other options I have for units to play would be the Battlesmith or a second Laurent Protégé, but they are too weak to, to block the Fearsome units, so it doesn't matter if I play those at all. My opponent has a lot of power right now on the board, um, this is 12. Oh my god. Yeah, so 12 uh, total damage on the board here. 4, 7, 10, 12. I wanted to quickly recount it there because I don't want to be a liar. And my Nexus health is only 17. I don't want to go down all the way to 5 HP. Luckily, my opponent's tapped out of mana. We don't have to worry about anything nuts like Mark of the Isles here. Um, but in order to bypass this really terrible situation I'm in, I decide to just tempo play the Va the uh, the Vanguard Redeemer. I get that extra 3-3 blocker in play, um, and this is going to give me a really, really strong uh, block against the uh, Frenzied Skitterer here. Against either the Frenzied Skitterer or maybe even the Mist Wraith. And so my opponent holds back the Elise because of the uh, Vanguard Redeemer getting a nice trade into it. So my opponent is uh, is respecting this play, which is very, very nice. Just by playing this, I've already saved two damage. Um, so looking at the board state here, um, we have the really good trade here with the Vanguard Redeemer. Be, be, no, excuse me, Vanguard Defender, uh, because it has tough. Remember, we talked about that earlier. So it's not going to take any damage from the Hapless Aristocrat. And then we have to figure out what unit we want the, uh, the Vanguard Redeemer to block. Um... It trades up cleanly into the Mist Wraith, the Wraith Caller, rather. Um, but I think the better line is to have the Redeemer block this 3-3 three, three because I can chump block the 4-3 uh, with other units that I might be able to summon. The 3-3 three, three, um, effectively has elusive against most of what I'm trying to develop here in these next handful of turns. So I'm going to opt for this line. Um, there is... There is a decision to be made here um, because what I could do is simply block the 4-3, save myself a little bit of damage, and then the 3-3 three, three punches through. I take three extra damage this turn in exchange for maybe uh, just developing the Garen next turn. You can see over here, we're going to be... Well, actually, i got to move my head. Uh, over here, we're going to be on five mana. 
next turn. So the Garens are about to come down. So I could take this damage here in exchange for setting up the Garen, knowing that those will be walled out later. But I believe... Um, I only quickly went over this uh, gameplay just to refresh my memory. I do believe I blocked the Wraith Caller here. I think I go for this line initially, and I think I switch. Yeah. So, so I end up going for this line. Ooh, which one do I take? Both, both, um, both sides, I think, have an, have an argument here. I actually go for the, uh, okay, I go for the more value-oriented line. Just taking out the uh, Wraith Caller, 4-3 into 3-3 three, three is a fantastic trade. I take that 3 damage, and I'm just going to try to rely on Garen to stonewall the game. This was one of the reasons we kept it in our opening hand. And now we're on the offensive turn. I can just attack with Garen here, um, and then I have to think, okay, does my opponent have uh, Mark of the Isles or something? That's the only... That's the only buff you have to worry about with, like, Mono Shadow Isles. If this was the Shadow Isles Noxus, you have to worry about a lot more stuff like Might or Brother's Bond or something. Um, but now, since I'm on offense, I get to use the Laurent Protégé to pluck one of these, uh, one of these Mist Wraiths. And my opponent goes for the Glimpse Beyond just to counter that. They're going to get their card draw. There is the option, too, of single combat. To deny this card draw. My opponent's down to three cards. I'm starting to hit my mid-game stride with this deck. So this is actually a really, really fine play. I get to cut off the card draw. I still kill the Mist Wraith. Garen, the... Uh, okay, so just to, to slow things down here. Garen's level up condition is striking twice. Um, and then he levels up. And then you get an extra rally at the start of every round. Um, so that you're able to attack every round rather than, again, than every other round. His stats get higher. He still keeps the regeneration keyword as well. And single combat um, make a, shoot, makes a unit of yours strike another unit, right? So that does count for his level up condition. So we get to get some level up progress on Garen, take out the Mist Wraith, cut off that card draw, save HP on the Laurent Protégé, and then Garen's just going to heal himself at the end of the round. So the single combat there, I think, was, was actually fantastic. I think in retrospect, um, if I attacked with the Laurent Protégé and maybe Garen, then if, you know, they block the Frenzied Skitterer, like blocks on Garen, I wouldn't be able to make that play without sacrificing Garen, right? So we're rewarded a little bit there by uh, by just attacking conservatively, just with the Laurent Protégé, to take out one of the peskier targets. And uh, another issue, too, is attacking the uh, Frenzied Skitterer or the uh, Mist Wraith. is simply because the Mist Wraiths get stronger and stronger as more Mist Wraiths and Wraith Callers are being summoned. So I think it's better to sort of nip that in the bud before it gets any bigger. So now it's on my opponent's turn. They do have the option to maybe open attack here and decide to go for another Mist Wraith. You see it comes into play as a 4-4, and then this gets buffed. And that was sort of the scenario we were trying to stop earlier. So I get to summon the Battlesmith here. And the Battlesmith grants plus 1, plus 1 to all Elites. Um, and the only elites we have in hand right now are Scythria of Cloudfield. If this Garen dies, this copy of Judgment here, if you recall, is actually a second copy of Garen. When a champion is in play, any additional copies of them that were already in your hand or that you draw become a copy of that champion's signature spell. So um, if this does become a copy of Garen that we want to replay, then the Battlesmith will buff that as well. Um, and so this is just a great way to just put a unit down on the board. Post-combat, we get to develop uh, Scythria, and because we're on four mana, we actually get to play both of these. And we'll have a lot of uh, pressure, too, with the uh, Protégé setting up better trades for the rest of our board. So now, we have to think about the trades we want to make here. Um, my opponent still has uh, a lot of mana open. We have to worry about stuff like Vile Feast, which is a one damage ping. So I'm not too thrilled about potentially blocking these 4-2s with, uh, with Garen. Um, I can block the 3-3 three, three here, just potentially protect him from Vile Feast, but you have to see again that um, Garen is my only viable blocker for this round, so 
looking again at the uh, 11 damage now from my opponent. Uh, I'm on 12. I have to try to block as much as possible. So I think I just have to... Uh, I have to opt to risk the Garen just dying to Vile Feast because I do have the backup copy. Ooh, I actually go for the 3-3? Three, three? No, I was about to say, yeah. So I do go for the I do go for the uh the more defensive block here. If they've got the Vile Feast, they've got it. Mm-hmm. And so there it is. And I'm still dead to uh Mark of the Isles there. Like the the offensive pressure from my opponent is real. Very, very real. And now post-combat, I get to develop some stuff. Going with the same play that we had set up prior with Battlesmith into Cythria of Cloudfield into Laurent Protégé. And so now it is our offensive turn. Elise levels up here because uh, the two Spiderlings and then the uh, Frenzied Skitterer. And so now... Uh, this is a really, really fortunate top deck, the uh, Swiftwing Lan the Swiftwing Lancer. We can summon him. My opponent has seven mana. I'm not too worried about anything like Ruination here. My opponent is playing like a wide swarmy deck, so they aren't going to have like a self-killing uh, board wipe like that, which is that nine mana spell. So we get to summon the Swiftwing Lancer here. And this stat line is fantastic to just threaten the Elise, the 5-4 to take out the 4-3. See what my opponent does. Their board is full, so like if they have like a Wraith Caller or something, they aren't going to get the value out of it. Which is really, really fortunate for me. They decide to go for Ancient Crocolith, which I felt was a pretty odd inclusion. Ancient Crocolith is a 7-7, and you saw there you have to sacrifice two units in order to summon it. Um... And so my opponent has created some room on their side of the board. They've gotten a really, really big unit in play that's going to be threatening uh, most of my board. I don't have anything that can contest it, really. Even the Garen uh, is scared of the 7-7 seven, seven stat line. So arguably, that is a very strong card in this particular situation. But at the same time, uh, because I have 5 HP left, I feel like you want to be... Uh, going a bit wider to be fair to be fair because I have three challenger units on board um, That's like the only opportunity I think my opponent would ever have to have two extra units that you can sacrifice to get the uh, the croc into play so uh, Good on them for recognizing that for sure. So we're just gonna go with our original plan uh, Swiftwing Lancer takes out the Elise and then we've got protege to take out this mist wraith and I'm thinking about where I want to go from there. The 3-3 three, three most likely gets blocked by the 7-7. Seven, seven. I could pull the 7-7 seven, seven if I wanted to with the with the Laurent Protégé to force this 3-3 three, three trade into the Cythria of Cloudfield. But I decide to just go for this line here um, to get a little bit of damage on both of them. And like re-watching re this footage... Uh, this is, again, this is a very long-term value-oriented play where the Laurent Protégé gets to potentially deal two damage to the Frenzied Skitterer here and uh, then still survive with one HP as a 2-1 in order to potentially uh, challenge another unit, right? Maybe even taking out another Mist Wraith, something like that. So this is, so this is thinking in terms of, like, long-term value, but if you were to pull the croc here instead and maybe force the Frenzied Skitterer to uh, block into the uh, Cythria of Cloudfield here, I think that uh, that would be an acceptable line as well. Because setting, this, setting the uh, Protégé down to 2-1 uh, still opens it up to die to Vile Feast regardless. And again, the Frenzied Skitterer doesn't even die. And now it's my uh, opponent's offensive turn. This is this is rough because they actually do get uh, three free damage here because I took that other line. Instead of forcing them to trade this off, arguably my opponent might have just let the uh, the damage through with the Scythria. They might not have used the Frenzied Skitterer to block at all. Um, but again, I've been living in mortal fear 
of Mark of the Isles for this entire time. Mark of the Isles, uh, just to refresh our memory, is one mana, give a unit plus three, plus three. The unit also gets ephemeral, but that downside means very, very little. Like, if the unit dies after it strikes or at the end of the round, it doesn't matter because if you end the game, the ephemeral is, uh, is a moot point, right? It doesn't matter if your unit dies if you just use it to win the game. Uh, so Mark of the Isles, very, very ridiculous card for sure. And it's, I'm trying to play around it as best as I can, but unfortunately, I haven't really drawn too much of my mid and late game units out of this deck quite yet in order to survive. So they get the free damage here. Oh my god, there's the Mark of the Isles. Fortunately, we have Detain, which I completely forgot about. Um, so Detain, let's, uh, let's rewind a little bit. So I wanted to try to, uh, <laughs> to pause this. Hang on, let me see. Can I, like, go frame by frame? I'm trying to... F I think... I'm pretty sure you can. I forget the VLC media player frame by frame controls. I thought it was just, like, left and right arrow keys, but maybe I'm mistaken. But... At any rate, I go for the instant uh, detain there. Um, so detain allows a friendly unit to capture, uh, an ally captures a unit. Um, so this is this is very interesting. Detain you can actually use to capture your own units. Um, you can use it to be like very sneaky, playing around like AOE spells or certain removals. But here, we're just going to use it to have a um, unit on our side of the board uh, capture the Frenzied Skitterer and detain it. Basically removes it from play until the Battlesmith leaves the board. And that can be through uh, it getting killed by a removal spell, it being sent back to your hand, uh, you know, with uh, Will of Ionia or something. My opponent just sacrifices the Frenzied Skitterer uh, with Glimpse Beyond to just draw two more cards. Um, now, this is really interesting, too, is because um, the way Detain works is the unit leaves play, and then it just comes back into play as, like, a base copy of itself. So it'll be cleansed of, like, all damage and extra effects. So I believe the Frenzied Skitterer, were the Battlesmith to die if the Detain had gone through, would just come back into play as a 3-3. And I believe its ability triggers again. So we've managed to survive that turn. That was actually very frightening. Um, good thing we had to deta the Detain, for sure. So we get to play the uh, Vanguard Sergeant or Garen. So we have the choice here to develop the Vanguard Sergeant and the Vanguard Defender, which is uh, three mana plus two mana, which would give us two things on board, or the Garen, which is just one big thing. Um, and I think, obviously, with the way that this deck is playing out, and because our HP is so low, we can't really afford to let anything through, I decide to go for the 3 plus 2. The Vanguard Sergeant, just for clarification, was created by the Swiftwing Lancer. Aside from being a 5 mana 5 4 with Challenger, Swiftwing Lancer also has the ability that when it dies, you create a random elite unit in your hand. So it gave us a copy of Vanguard Sergeant. And then Vanguard Sergeant creates a copy of For, For Demacia when uh, it is played. So my opponent actually has the Black Spear here. And uh, and that's only active because they sacrificed their Frenzied Skitterer. Yeah, and see, my opponent has another Wraith Caller. So I'm really, really happy I went for the, uh, I went for the 3 plus 2 line there. This is still really spooky because not only do the uh, Wraith Callers summon a Mist Wraith, um, they also have main deck wrist, uh, Mist Wraiths. And the Mist Wraiths coming into play just keep buffing each other back and forth and back and forth. So now they're up to six twos um, and Fearsome. So you can't just stick a little wimpy body in front of them. Fearsome units need to be blocked by units with three or more power. Um, fortunately, the, uh, the Sergeant was able to be buffed by the uh, Battlesmith before it died. So we have a 4-4 to help us with the effort here. 
And now it's our offensive turn, which is also nice. Uh, this turn would normally be very frightening if my opponent was going back on offense, but it is our turn to attack. This Laurent Protégé is still alive from that weird value trade we took a while ago. Um, and now with Fleet Feather Tracker plus Garen, now we have another challenger unit on board, and we're able to uh, to fight against a couple of these myth rate, mist wraiths. So we're just going to go for that. Ooh, yeah, so I almost pulled a croc, and I realized that I need to take these out. Because these are the, the units that are going to be hardest for me to deal with. And I'm also thinking about uh, whether or not I want to attack with anything else here. In situations like this, where you are... Um, where you're trying to fight back for the board and you're on defense, right? And your opponent's keeping you under pressure, um, especially against fearsome. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult to, uh, to figure out what you should be doing. Um, and I think that the, the trick here is trying to keep the board as equalized as possible. Um, if I attack with the five, five, then the seven, two, uh, trades into it or, you know, even the 4-4, four, four, this ephemeral 4-3 trades into it. I basically don't have any good trades here, and I need to keep the board equalized so that no nothing can get around the sides. I need to be able to block as many things as possible at all times. And so in the sake of just equalizing the board, taking out my opponent's largest threats to me, um, I can't really afford to attack with anything else here because it would leave me at a numbers disadvantage. Um, even with the 4 Demacia, it doesn't matter what the stat line is on my units if uh, my opponent just over uh, just open attacks. As soon as their turn starts, they just go right into combat. I can't cast this for Demacia because it's slow. Uh, it's just a spell that's generated by the uh, Vanguard Sar Sergeant, and it gives your units plus three, plus three. But again, it's a slow spell, so it's not going to uh, afford me any sort of uh, comfort here. So now it's my opponent's offensive turn. Um, this is this is a dead card for the most part, so we're both my opponent and I are just top decking. And so now, because the numbers are lining up in our favor, we get to uh, we get to block everything here beautifully. We get the five three into the uh, the five five into the four three. The four four gets to block the seven two, and then R two two gets to block the other seven two. So if the combat goes through here, then we are left with just Garen into our opponent's empty board and. The only downside would be if uh, this was maybe a Vile Feast or a Mark of the Isles or something to buff the Wraith Caller to try to uh, contest Garen and take him out. That is that is our main concern, but we did draw a Detain so we can uh, stuff that attempt if need be. Yep, and so here comes the Vile Feast, and we opt to Detain here because I need to I need to protect Garen. It's uh, because it's uh, we're in a top deck war situation where my opponent and I essentially have no cards in hand. Um, having a 5-5 with regeneration is just the sort of threat that's going to be very difficult for my opponent to go through. This is very uh, risky for me, however, the detain on uh, the Wraith Caller, simply because uh, my opponent is running Mono Shadow Isles. And so despite all of the aggressive units and uh, buffs that we've seen in this deck, they're still going to have a few more slots potentially because you got to remember, even though they're Mono Shadow Isles, they're only running Elise. There's no Hecarim or anything. So in lieu of having a late game finisher of that nature, my opponent could have uh, dipped into things like Ross of the Sunderer or Commander Ledros um, or Vengeance, right? Specifically is what I'm looping around to. If my opponent casts Vengeance on Garen, it dies the Wraith Caller goes back onto my opponent's side of the board, and then its Allegiance ability will activate, and it'll summon another Mist Wraith, and I'll lose the game. So the Detain here is, again, a huge risk-reward to just keep the Garen alive, but it could set up for a disaster if my opponent does have those removals. Especially because, in this instance, I am on offense. If I attack, my opponent blocks with the 1-1 uh, Spider, and then it sets up Ross of the Sunderer to kill both of my units. And that's just, that's a huge risk I essentially need to take. I've been, like, hoping for outs against Mark of the Isles forever. I have to hope that they don't have Ross of the Sunderer here. Um, because if I just sit here and wait, um, 
trying to play on my roster the, the Sunderer, then maybe they are able to answer my board some other way and then I just fall behind. Or if they go too wide with like a Brood Awakening, they've got another Elise here. You see things like that. Um, so unfortunately, once you're, when you're this far behind, when you're just living on a prayer with 5 HP, you have to start taking some bigger risks to get back into the game. Uh, so my opponent's just going to go for offense here. Um, taking out the Battlesmith, which is interesting. Again, this is uh, this is for value. The Battlesmith isn't going to kill Elise. And this is a nice way for her to get value because of my Swift Wing Lancer. Um, the Elise just kills the Battlesmith there and goes down to a 4-1. If Elise doesn't uh, go for combat there, then the... Because the, the, the Lancer here, right? The, the Silver Wing, the Swift Wing Lancer is just going to kill her. Um, so by just getting that preemptive value, uh, they get to double dip on the Elise there, which is fantastic. And I opt to just block the Undying with Garen. Um, even though my opponent's hand was empty, they aren't threatening like Mark of the Isles or any additional damage. Um, that is the extra strike I need for Garen to level up as we saw there. So now I'll be rallying every single round and I'll be able to keep my opponent under constant offensive pressure by just attacking every round, attacking every round. Uh, especially again with Garen, who's just going to be regenerating health. I'm basically dealing six damage repeatedly that my opponent has to find something to do with. Uh, where where do they put that six damage? That's a three turn clock. Um, anything that they summon most likely is going to die to the uh, six six. If they do, do if they draw another uh, croc, they don't have the two units in play to sacrifice and summon it. So this Garen is functionally immune unless my opponent draws vengeance. Um, what's also very nice here is that even though the Undying will revive as a three three next round, it can't block. So uh, it buys me a, basically a turn of free attacking as well. And I can just continuously block the Undying for, for several turns. And so we just go for the uh, War Chefs, and then my opponent does nothing, and then plays for Demacia. The fact that my opponent did nothing there tells me that this spell isn't Vengeance or, or ruination, like my opponent could just be like, haha, I baited you into playing one more thing from your hand before I cast ruination, and that's a very unlikely play that I would play another unit like that. Um, so we, we pretty much know it's not ruination, because if they had it, they would have just played it to get rid of these two big threats. So we get to summon, we get to play the four Demacia finally, uh, and now that the now, because the Undying can't block, right, that's the that's what this symbol means, this little uh, black X on the shield. Uh, the Undying can't block, the Lancer just pulls the Elise out of the way, and then we get the uh, Battle Chefs to attack alongside Garen. Battle Chefs grants the supported ally plus one, plus one, so then that's the perfect 15 damage we need for lethal. My opponent recognizes this and surrenders. So you can see how um, when you're in a situation where you're super far behind, you there are some times where you do have to take a lot of big risks, but there are some uh, some smart plays that you can make uh, to help you out there. Thank you once again for joining me for today's episode. I hope that you learned a little something that you can carry with you in your games in the future. Uh, don't forget that you can see me play some of these decks live every Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday on my Twitch channel. Um, if you did like what you saw today, please don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment. I respond to all of them, and I read every single one of them. So uh, all of your feedback is really, really greatly appreciated because I want to make this series uh, as good as it can be. So until next time, you have a good one.